Peter, I know you think a lot about the Fed and macro stuff, but if you will for a second, I want to ask you about what you saw in the last earnings season, the one that's developing. I was reading one of your recent notes. I thought I had a really good deep dive. You looked at companies like Amazon, Capital One, trying to find signs of that strain where prices are higher and demand is weak. How glaring are the signs? How comforting are they? What did you find? Well, it's important to slice and dice the economy because people like to talk about is it strong, is it weak, is it this or that. When you look at the existing home market in the country, it's the epitome of stagflation. You have prices up 45% over the last three years. And in the weekly mortgage application data, purchase applications are at a 28-year low. That's a fantastic point. That's the epitome of stagflation. You have manufacturing, not just in the U.S., but globally, is in a recession. And keep in mind, with existing home sales, for every new home that's not sold, there's less carpet that needs to be put down. There's less paint. There's less hiring movers. There's a lot of peripheral activity that does not happen when you don't get that existing home sale. Now, you can say, well, if people are going to stay in their homes, maybe they'll re renovate it. But they did that already in 2020, 2021 during COVID. Uh, with respect to the consumer and to your point about what are these companies saying, that's bifurcated too. The lower income consumer is clearly stretched. When you see numbers at a Dollar General and Dollar Tree and McDonald's, and they're talking about how stretched their customer is, that says a lot when you can barely afford a cheeseburger. Uh, but even the, the higher income consumer, which is more flush, and that's where a lot of the spending is happening, but you have Walmart talking about more people making over 100 grand shopping in their store. McDonald's even talked about it a couple weeks ago in their earnings call. When you have Canagra talking about, and they, they get this information through surveys, saying that people are paying more attention to the inventory in their pantry. They don't want things to go to waste. And when, when they, when they want to cook a meal, they're not just cooking for themselves, they're cooking for multiple people, so it lasts multiple meals. There is a stress out there in the economy. And even when you look at the Q3 GDP, which was around 5%, business investment was flat. So this inflation deflation argument, I see the 1970s. We had a spike in inflation. Now we have the come down. But there is, there, we are not going to be investing in things for the next couple of years because of the high cost of capital. If you wanted to build a multifamily apartment building today, you would not be able to do it. You would not be able to raise the equity, and you would not be able to get a loan. So while there is about a million units that are, that are currently under construction right now, and rental prices will be subdued for the next year, after that, rents are going skyrocket. Because of an 8% mortgage rate, that first-time buyer is going to be renting and not buying, and there's going to be almost no new supply after the current batch is done. So we're gonna get the dip in prices and prices are gonna go straight back up because there's gonna be a little capacity being added in the economy during these couple of years of a much higher cost of capital. So you've gotta think that traditional inflation metrics are gonna be going quite a bit higher when that kicks in because that's a huge component, rent. You're saying rent's gonna come back after being one of the biggest disinflationary components of the past year. Yes, I, I guess my bottom line inflation, I'm expecting a lot of inflation volatility. And volatility with a higher low. The important thing to look at with inflation is, you know, there are two components. Services inflation, there was nothing ever transitory about services inflation. Services inflation X energy in the 20 years leading into COVID averaged 2.8% a year. Nothing transitory about that. Goods prices, core goods prices averaged zero. So you want to get the inflation story right, you got to get the goods price right. And with the labor costs going up, even though they're plateaued, they're still running about double where we were pre-COVID. There is a structurally higher cost of doing business that I think is going to lead to structurally higher inflation. Not 9% inflation, but something like 3 to 4 instead of 1 to 2. Mike, I can see you itching because... On a sustainable basis. That, after this downturn, on a sustainable basis. I mean, that's a, pretty, that's a pretty big argument against what you were saying earlier, right? Because what you're describing, packaging, goods, etc., that's essentially the manufacturing inflation that was arguably very COVID specific. What Peter's saying is that services inflation will be persistent, which challenges the deflation view you laid out. So Peter and I can make a good market. We'll make a tight spread. So first two books, um, Price of Tomorrow by Jeff Booth, a New York Times bestseller about how deflationary forces in technology. 
Um, Superabundance, another book, I read like a few chapters of that and I got the key point is, what's, I'll point out how deflation is significantly part of what's happening in the world. First of all, let's start macro and economic. China is very much, I think, similar to what I read in the book Atlas Shrugged, a combination of peak Japan and a combination of peak Soviet Union. Bloomberg Intelligence ex ex estimates that the amount of the, the, the property value in China that's at risk of default is about 12% of GDP. So it's just a normal reversion overdue and a classic catalyst, completely autocratic readership. We know what happens with that. We've seen it. So it's tilt over. So that's macro. It's global. Europe's in a recession and they just tightened recently. PMIs are negative. Um, retail sales are negative. X, X, um, X inflation. In, in this country, retail sales are negative, X inflation, and the Fed's still tightening. So we have kind of a global problem there. And then the dollar break, the dollar is the, the wrecking ball. Why is the yen dropped almost 50% in two years and the yuan still collapsing? Because they can't keep up and their rate's almost zero and the U.S. is at 5%. So there's the macro. The U.S. still towards recession. Let's look at housing in the U.S. Existing home sales is about the lowest level versus the ratio of new homes under construction. The, the ratio of to total new homes under construction in this country is almost the highest ever. And you know what happens with that? It means the inventory comes on and a lot of those deals are already done. Um, unemployment. Unemployment just bottomed from 3.4%. In the history of unemployment, our data goes back to 1940, it's never bottomed from a low this level without going back to 6%. 6%, about 7% is the average since about 1940 in this, in this country. So we just bottomed, we have a, just a simple mathematics of it. And almost every single time we've had this point, it starts inching higher, the Fed's already started to ease. So to me, this is a classic cycle that none of, it's a hundred year cycle. We've never had this long period of zero interest rates. We've never had a period where three years ago, everybody in this country thought we were gonna die. And there was a risk we could die. Some of us knew a lot of people who did die. There was a good reason to pump the liquidity system. Poof, that ended. We got vaccines within six months. China messed it up. So to me, these cycles are just getting started. And where you see it, first of all, let's look at, I'll end with two things. Leading indicators in this country are minus, year over year, minus 7.8%. We've never had it that low for that long without a recession. That's a 100-year piece of data. Uh, and I look at it as, yes, we're impatient. But we also had something that happened that never happened in the history of this country is we increased our deficit this year around 8% for a while. We've never done that absent a recession or war. So how have we goosed the economy? Massive fiscal stimulus. And because of that fiscal stimulus, we've tightened another 100 basis points this year. And the lessons are all about liquidity. So to me, this is just a normal cycle. So I'll end with this, I guess. The last two corrections for recessions in this country, S&P 500 dropped 50%. And the Fed started easing well before they met their, met their lows. In SEP 2007, the low was until 2009. And be beginning of 2001, the low was until the end of 2002. So why should it be different this time?